Hello. Bells will be ringing. Just a little fun there. Anybody missing somebody this Christmas? Yeah, me too. Me too. My 18-year-old son left on Sunday. He's living it up in the Bahamas on a 78-foot yacht. So this is our first Christmas without somebody. So that's all right. I am not Y'all sing with us. We need some instruments up here.
Awesome. Glad you're, exci- uh, glad you're here to work. Uh, what are we doing? Worship. There it is. I'm used to saying thanks for coming to work. <laughs> That's a little later today. Uh, we'll be excited. Who's on vacation? That's a month or less on Fort Myers Beach. A month or less. All right. Cool. Cool. Back in the, in the pew in front of me, there's a white slip. Why don't you fill that out, take it to the coffee shop when we're done, and uh, you get a free gift just for being here. It's just our way of saying thank you for coming to church while you're on vacation um, and having a good time with us. So, all we've got is a little yeah. So I don't know if that's um, you were looking for something else or not, but Jesus is what we got, right, Dusty? Yeah. <laughs> Before they sing their last song, if I can just have like one announcement spot for you, um, we're in need of a few things today. We got a big thing going on tonight. Uh, we're going to give away over 112 bi- uh, bicycles right here, right here uh, tonight. And it's going to take a lot of us to do it. So if, if you can help me right after church today, if you can stay for a little while, just tell me that. Say, I can stay right now for a couple hours, and I'll let you know what we can do. And then if you can help tonight, be here at 3 o'clock, um, and we'll, we'll get you assigned into your spot. Uh, but it's, it, it will seriously take about 20 of us just to pull off the presents. Um, and, and then we got a whole party for all these kids too. So, and if you can't help, come watch, come eat, because it's a great time for Jesus to get explained to the rest of the world uh, about why we're doing this, all right? Many of them won't see a manger scene all year long, and they get to see one here. Um, and there's always questions, what's that for, and, and all that sort of thing. So it's a great time to tell the story. Yes, ma'am. I was getting there. I was using guilt for a little bit, and then, then I, it's a whole process for me. Yeah, so here's what I was going to do, and you see if this works. How many of you can't be here tonight? Go ahead, go ahead and tell me. It's okay. Go ahead and tell me. Okay, all I need you to do is bring some finger food this afternoon beforehand, and that will be kind of your penance, okay? You'll feel much better. Everybody else who's coming, you got to bring something too, all right? So nobody gets out of it. Uh, no, we do need some finger food. We're going to feed everybody 400, but potentially 300, so it's a good number. So uh, have some, we need some stuff. So just be, and if you can't do any of that, just go play on the beach. I don't care. No, it's okay. Just remember what's going on in this building. Uh, say a little prayer if you want, and that would be awesome. Come support if you can. That'd be even better. All right? So let's, let's pray together, and then uh, let's get back to our worship time. God, we are just so thankful that you sent yourself with skin on that we can celebrate this time of year. May we learn today about giving and what that really means for those that will never, ever be able to give back to us. In your name we pray. Amen.
can give back of everything you've already given us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, come on down. Come on down. Where are you going? Hey, stay with me. Stay. Stay with me. Say was dirty, and they didn't take a bath last night. Dude, a bug wants to know why mom and dad's clothes are wet. Look, they're back. There. Look, did you know they're dry now? They're, see, they're dry. They brought more clothes. <laughs> okay, final days, right? It's leading up. Everything you've waited for. It's getting ready to happen, right? Try not to be a little excited. You need to tone it down. You're at church, okay? What? What you got? What? Oh, seriously, what are you, a pyrotechnic? Yes, ma'am. Was it really cold in the water? <laughs> yes. Why? Well, because someone didn't write a check. <laughs> and buy me a heater. Hint, hint. <laughs> Try it after church. I don't care. You'll feel the pain. So it's, it's almost over. The, the wait. Now, remember, we've been lighting candles, and they symbolize waiting. So three Sundays ago, we started this and lit a candle, that first one over on the left. And then the next time we wrote, lit, lit this one. We talked about hope, and we talked about peace, right? Last week? Yeah, what did you talk about last week? I wasn't here. Don't ask me. <laughs> no, that's Christmas. What day? No, there was a day lit with this candle. I mean, there was a word. Oh, I did that. What's the word? Randy. Joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Toast. So we've got hope, peace, and joy lit. Anybody want to guess what this one? No, that's not color. Teacher's pet. Teacher's pet. No, I like you. Go ahead. You think it's love? Why would you think it's love? So what you're saying is all you need is love. They're way too young for that one. <laughs> but it's it. And it, it, you said it is a song. You're right, it is a song. But it's, suppo but it's supposed to be our life motto. It is all you need, Okay. And it's not necessarily, not, we're not talking about all I need is love for you. Tell me your name. Ryan. That's not all I need. I, I need it, but that's not all I need. The love that's all you need is the one that God can give us. That's the love that that's all you need. Let's watch our video and see what it says, and then uh, we'll dismiss and go after class. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Love is as strong as death, jealousy as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your steadfast love is better than life. God's love has been poured into our hearts. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his Son into You're right, it's love. That's right. Seems to be a homeroom. Um 
But there's another word in there that I want you to pick today. It's a big word, but you need to learn the word. Have you ever been in school and, like, you got a best friend, and that best friend one day does something maybe you don't like? Maybe it's horrible. And that day, you don't necessarily love them. Or it doesn't feel like they love you. Anybody ever had that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's how people are, right? People, people. I love Papa. You love Papa? That's sweet. Okay, this analogy will not work for Papa. <laughs> there was another word up there, and it called it steadfast. Anybody know what steadfast means? Tell me. Actually, not even close. <laughs> Sorry. Steadfast means you'll never, ever feel that from God. He's never going to do even the slightest thing that makes you think he doesn't love me. Steadfast means he always does. It is steadfast. It is set firm. Always going to love you. It's different. The love is different that God has for us and that you have for him than it is one another steadfast love um shelby papa love would you like to light the candle well, i know you would everybody likes to light the candle come here come on come on it's the shoes that got you the job today i'm just telling you well, what are you doing What's up? Ooh, big. <laughs> Not the white one. That messes everybody up. <laughs> well, what are you waiting on? Come on. Oh, you, oh, it's a magic lighter. You just say fire. Fire. <laughs> yeah. Dad's a little preacher light. Doesn't count. Okay, <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Now squeeze. Fire. Do it again. Do it again. Say fire. Fire. Oh! <laughs> I told you it'd work. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Miss Selby. Y'all go with Miss Dawn. Yes, you can walk yourself because you've played with fire. <laughs> Aren't they cute? Pretty good time of the year, right? Yeah. Yeah, see, when you say that, it, 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 in some people's minds, it's like, not really. Um, true. It's not. I will tell you, if it's not a good time of year for you, you might have a problem with focus, but that's okay. Don't, don't beat yourself up for it. Christmas time, because of the way we've done it for so long, generates emotion that maybe you haven't had all year uh, or it, it triggers things in our brain it shouldn't okay it, it is our fault as a culture it's our fault that that's happened uh, because no matter how you look at it when our when our when our season's focused in the right direction joy is the only thing that can come out these things that we've been waiting on joy hope peace and love all those and none of those are sad so it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue for us to center ourselves back on around this time if you're having trouble. And I hope you can do that. I, I pray that you will see Christmas for what it is, what it truly is. Okay, and, and, and put, another bumper of sugar, put Christ back in Christmas. Not in the Word, I'm not worried about that. But actually put Him in your Christmas, you know, and, and kind of encompass Him around. So, but for Christians anyway, this time of year is, is pretty cool because we actually believe true True statements that we believe that God put skin on and came in one of those little things we call a manger 
and he was born to a virgin, and he did all that to put us back in good standings with God. We believe that happened. And, but more importantly, we believe that that intersected history, and we believe that it all came together. The, the, the secular world's view of what's going on is true, okay? We just believe that this Jesus part of it was a whole lot bigger than maybe they're giving credit for. So it's a really big time for us, and we just, we just believe that it all comes together. So this time of year, it's really fun. We're going to talk about it. You know how fun it is to be generous to strangers? Everybody like that? Go ahead. Let's just get real honest this morning. It's great to be generous with strangers, right? It's great to see. Yeah, it's totally. And it's, you know, especially when you find somebody who can't maybe help themselves. You know, they need help. How, how cool is it this time of year to be able to be that part, to come in underneath and to support something? Yeah, right, right, okay. Now you're starting to get scared. I know. It's okay. <laughs> You probably should have been, I don't know. And how much, if you come tonight to watch a kid's eyes light up, did you see Shelby when she said fire? When the eyes get really big, that's cool to watch at this time of year, right? So if you come tonight and you see that and the bikes come across the stage and the kid goes, wow, that kind of stuff. So that's like, oh, wow, that feels awesome to have given that child that. And you all had a part of that. And when they open their presents, some of you got, got uh, name tags off of those trees. Yeah, they all left. And, and you brought gifts back, and we're going to give them to them tonight. And you're going to see, maybe, you're going to see your gift opened. And you're going to see it. And maybe the child's going to go, oh, my gosh. I never thought I'd get that. Or the mom or the dad sitting over there, and maybe they start crying. Oh, my gosh, I'd have never been able to if you hadn't have done it. You'll hear that tonight like a hundred times. We'd have never been able to do this for our kids. How cool is that, right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it is. All right. And listen, we've been going full bore at this for like a month, probably a little longer, getting all this ready and, and, and trying, to, trying to get it put together and, to, and, to, and to, to get just for it to all happen tonight so that we can feel that, so that we can see that, so that we can appreciate the giving so that we can be part of the giving, and there's nothing wrong with the giving. That's awesome. We're supposed to get that way. Wait, can I take a minute? Is that, can I have one? Can I have a minute? Is that all right? Okay, because we believe it's truly better to give than receive. But I don't, I don't make recognition to anybody normally because it does take an army and a village for this to all happen. But, but one lady uh, in our right here with you has put in since Thursday over 40 hours just in, just in the tonight stuff, just in the presence. She didn't get paid for it. That was just her thing. She wanted to do it, and she did it. So, Amanda, thank you. Come here. Come here. I got something for you. Come here. That's my Christmas card. I got you a Home Depot gift certificate. And I didn't really get her a Home Depot gift certificate. I got Dave a Home Depot gift certificate. <laughs> so, okay, so I had to do that. I just had to do that. Uh, but we understand the giving. We, we understand that it is better to give than it is receive. We've been saying that and saying that and saying that and saying that. And, and, and we do understand it. But, but, here's the but. The challenge is to do this good, okay, is to be this generous to those who wouldn't be that way to you. That's the challenge. And maybe even to be generous and good to those who have actually been bad to you. To, to pointedly go and be good when culture doesn't dictate that you should. You see, it's extremely normal for you to feel the giving generosity to those you don't even know. To pull an arbitrary number off of a tree and buy gifts. That one is ghoul and generous. But the tension, the problems that you and I have is doing that same kindness and generosity to those who would never, ever do it to you or who actually have done something bad to you. You see, it's difficult to be good to those who have hurt us. It's difficult to be good to those who remind us of those who have hurt us. It's difficult to be kind and generous to those who represent a type of person or a group of people who have hurt us. So be honest, it's easier 
to be kind and generous to complete strangers than it is to your neighbors. It's easier to be kind and generous to complete strangers than it is to some of your relatives. Some of you are already struggling with Thursday, maybe Wednesday, maybe your holiday time is Wednesday for everybody, and you're struggling with whether you need to invite that person. You're struggling with whether you really want to go and be around them because of what they've done. You're struggling with, should you even reach out? You're, you're struggling with, man, I just, I wish we could just get past it and I didn't even have to deal with it. I don't even want to go. They're always going to be this way. And you've got your list of things that they have a problem with that rub you the wrong way and you're having a problem being kind and generous to the people you know but you have no problem being kind and generous to the complete strangers that's a problem jesus actually addresses the problem he does it in a way that you might not have seen it we're going to look at it today and i think you can probably get it and then when you get it you're gonna be like oh my gosh i got it some reason, one person has hurt you, and that's ruined your attitude about an entire group of people. Maybe it's white girls. Maybe it's black men. Maybe it's policemen. Maybe it's people who are on welfare. Maybe it's people who are in charge of money, financial institutions, things that's happened in your past, and you automatically relate others to that. Maybe it's just somebody who is... Uh, mean to you. Maybe they were a little mean to one of your kids or just one of your family members, and now that person represents another group of people to you. And you've created this little thing in your mind that you'll never ever let them close again. But see, when we come to this time of year, it's like God reached down into that manger and He took every excuse away that you have. And we end up being just a little hypocritical at this time of year. Probably more so than any other time. Because we pick and choose who we're kind and generous to. And we have an entire list of quantifiers that you and I use to decide how and how good we treat certain groups and certain people. Aren't you kind of glad he didn't do that? Aren't you kind of glad that God didn't pick and choose you and decide, nah, not for you. Nah, salvation's not going to be for you. Everybody else, maybe. You know, I haven't really got to know them, so I'll give to them. But you, I know what you've done. You see, God is direct opposite. He knows just how bad we are and how bad the world is and was. And he gave anyway. And he's our model. Why then have we switched it? It's happened for centuries. It's happened since the beginning. And Jesus, as I said, talked it. See, truth be told, some of you would rather serve 100 hours in a soup kitchen than to serve one person a bowl of soup that you know. Some of you would rather give $10 a week every week of the year than to buy a group or a representative of a group of people one cup of coffee. We have that in our brains. We've set that up. So I want to look at this one story in Jesus' life that illustrates this tension that, that you and I have, especially at this time of year, and th this tension with compassion and joy and being kind to strangers or those we don't know versus those we do know or represent people that we know. Uh, and I want you to kind of think about that group the whole, whole day. I, that's who I want you to be thinking about is that group or that person because they're already in your head. Wives, you've probably already nudged somebody next to you. I guess you can go ahead and call your mother. That's what you've done. All right, call him, call him, whatever. Whatever, preacher, we'll call him. Not yet. This story happens right after Jesus finishes his most famous sermon. We call it the Sermon on the... Don't be so excited, Mount. Yeah, Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. So we, we have him coming down from this, basically a mountaintop experience. He's preaching, he's teaching, there's groups everywhere. It's been a long, arduous process, and there's been miracles, there's all kinds of things. And he's taught all those things that you hear people pithily put back to you. And that's when he taught it. And now he's coming down, and there's still a large crowd with him. And, and you kind of got to get the picture. He's coming down the mountain, and there's a big group, and there's the disciples, there's posse. 
and he's, they've kind of created this arch, and they've got their Uzis, they're on their backs, you know, and they're, they're coming down the hill, and they're like, we with him, you know, it's cool. And now we're headed, now we're headed, we don't even know we're headed, but we think it's cool that we're headed that way, because he's headed that way. And as he comes down the mountain, remember, he had just wrapped up the sermon, and he finishes his Sermon on the Mount with the parable of the wise man and the foolish man. Remember that? You don't remember that? Well, you'll just have to believe me. Wise man, foolish man, finish it. The story said that the wise man built his house on the rock. When the rains came down, floods came up. Rains came down and the floods came up. Rains came down and the floods came up. Y'all remember that song? You do? <laughs> right. And the foolish man built his house on the sand. Them rains came down, that floods came up. And his house went. <laughs> That's what it says. Not, not the Bible, the song. Basically, it's what the Bible says, though. He's telling about that story, the wise man, the foolish man. And then Jesus says, now, here, listen, you, you all, that's listening. All of you who hear my voice and, and do what I said, do. Not write it down, not say amen, go, go mm-hmm, tell them, brother. Not those. But those who hear the words and do them, you're like that wise man. All of you who listen to my words and you go, it's not for me. You're like the foolish man. Did I say that right? I get mixed up. So here we come down the mountain. I don't think it's an accident that as soon as he comes down the mountain, we get Matthew verse eight, or chapter 8, verse 1, and here's what it says. Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds following, disciples are all there. And then verse 2 says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. There's a whole bunch of stuff right there, a whole bunch of stuff. First of all, he stops the entire parade, okay, coming down the mountain. He's headed to Capernaum. Jesus in the group, we know where they're going. And the man with leprosy comes, and he drops himself down. Now, the man with leprosy has perfect faith. It tells us in just a minute. Do you know why the man with leprosy has perfect faith? Just don't know. Uh, Perfect faith is, perfect faith is not, Lord, I, Lord, will you, Lord, will you, or Lord, you, Lord, will you, okay? Perfect faith is, Lord, I know you can, Lord, I know you can, I hope you will. That's perfect faith. That is confidence that he can, faith, and hope that he will. But confidence, either way. That's perfect faith. That's what it says. Lord, if you're willing, you can. Okay, so I hope you will. I know you can. It's perfect faith. So this guy stops the whole process and says, okay, I know where to go, right? Pretty smart guy. He's heard the stories. I know where to go. I'm going to drop myself in front of Jesus, and I'm going to ask him to heal me because I know he can. So Jesus stops. And he says, guess what? I'm willing. You're clean. It's a little different. It's, it's about like that, though. Guess what? I'm willing. You're clean. And off he goes. You see, all the people around him have like, they just heard the sermon. And as soon as the, the leper got knelt down, I'm sure everybody around was like, okay, he just said, blessed are the meek. I wonder what he's going to do with this guy. I wonder what he's going to do with this guy. He's a stranger. Um, we're supposed to love him, right? Oh, this guy's in need. He's in real need. Let's see what Jesus does with the guy that's in real need. Good teaching, right? The guy was in need. Jesus healed him. Great teaching. But it gets worse. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Now, how many of y'all have read that verse? Ever? I'm talking about ever. Okay, now you can all raise your hand because you just read it. <laughs> From now on, when everybody asks, you ever read that verse? You're like, heck yeah. How many of y'all read that verse before and was like, oh, cool. Now what? Did it even spark anything in your brain? 
because it hadn't for a while in mind. But you cannot understand. I'm going to try to help you understand, but it's hard to understand the amount of emotion in those two sentences or in those two lines. The amount of emotion is there. There was no illustration. I heard one illustration. Andy Stanley gave it. I love the illustration, so I'm going to give it to you. If you don't like it, email andystanley at northpoint.org. Okay? Here's the illustration, and it's mostly for guys. Guys, think back. You're in high school, maybe late junior high, and you're in the basement with the girls. The TV's on, but you're not watching the TV. You're going at it. A few minutes, and you're not even vertical anymore. Lights are off, TV's flickering, and you're kind of engrossed in the moment. A couple seconds later, the lights flick on. And there's her dad staring at you. Fast forward two days. You're in the lunch, not in the hospital. You're in the lunchroom. <laughs> That's probably truer to the story, but for my illustrative purposes, hang with me. You're in the lunchroom. You're telling your buddies the story. Oh, yeah, we were, yeah, mm hmm, yeah, and came on. There he was. At no point do you have to say, I was so embarrassed. I was so scared. It was so awkward. You never, ever say those things. Because your buddies are right there with you. And they're like, oh. What's the only question your buddies ask you? What happened? That's all they want to know. That, that feeling, exponentially happened right there to those people standing around Jesus when the centurion came up and asked for help. It all got quiet. It was completely awkward. Because they wanted to know What's he going to do? Because everyone in the first century, everyone who read this, everyone who heard this, uh, everyone who was right there, understood the tension that just happened in the air that got crazy, like hair standing up on end crazy. Because you see, a Roman centurion didn't just represent himself, represented the entire history of, of the Jews to the Roman Empire. Sixty years prior to Jesus even being born, Pompey went to Jerusalem, rode up the steps on his horse, through the gates, into the temple, ripped open the curtain of the Holy of Holies, where only the priests could go. Okay? As history even tells us that they butchered the priests as they were going in. Ran into the Holy of Holies to see this God that the Jews were worshiping. And he found nothing. And on that day, Judea and Galilee lost their independence. They realized to Rome there was no God. He wasn't there. They didn't understand. And later, Sarasus, just a few later, Sarasus would come in and, and they would desecrate the Holy of Holies. They would, they would destroy, they, would they took everything of value. It's in Rome, it's, paint, it's uh, carved, remember in Titus's uh, colonnade. I told you about that, where they, they just took everything out of there and desecrated the whole thing just to keep the Jews at bay, just to tell the Jews who was in charge. Not long after that, Rome would appoint a king over Israel, and it wouldn't even be a Jewish guy. He was an Edomite, which was just salt on a wound. It just, it just horrible to them. He became known as Herod the Great, but the Jews didn't think he was so great. I mean, it was this guy who murdered two of his own wives, three of his sons, and slaughtered so many rabbis and Jewish leaders that it created so much havoc and chaos around Jerusalem that they hated Herod the Great. Hated him. This is all the buildup. To get to where these guys are. This is the guy who sent butchers into Bethlehem to kill all the babies so that none of them could grow up and be king. 
even though he was so old, none of the kids would still be, I mean, he wouldn't be around when any of the kids got of age to be king. And then later it would be his son that took over and had John the Baptist beheaded. By the time Jesus is standing at the bottom of that mountain at Caper, into Capernaum and having this conversation, Rome's realized they can't appoint a king over Judea, so they appoint a governor. Pontius Pilate is now in place. He's the guy who introduced crucifixion to the Galileans and to the whole region. He's the one that's got all these people standing around Jesus right now, scared to death of everything Rome or Roman. He's the guy that's sending people like this guy, the centurion. A centurion got his name by being two things, violent and submissive. A centurion was a centurion as long as you would do what you were told to do without one speck of question. This guy standing here, not only representing all of the evil that Rome has done and is doing, but representing the evil he himself has done. He has sent himself people into villages to rape the women, to kill the children for one purpose, to prove that Rome is still dominant over Jewish people. And he probably did it the day before he's standing in front of Jesus asking for a favor. That's how tense the moment is. People looking at Jesus going, what's he going to do with this guy? What would you be saying? What would you be hoping? Jesus said. Verse 6 tells us, Lord, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. If I were Jesus, I would say, seriously? Your servant, number one, your slave? The guy you probably bought at auction, who you own. Luke tells us that this slave, this servant, was a well-loved servant. So the centurion's actually asking for a personal favor from Jesus. Which I would have responded again, seriously? Suffering, your guys at home suffering, you are the epitome of suffering. You are the one who causes suffering. We probably only, somebody answer the phone. We probably only have the word suffering because of you. And you want to tell me about one of your slaves at home who's suffering? And you want a favor from me? If you were the crowd, what would be your answer? Seriously? I would be more, okay, so now I'm not Jesus, now I'm the crowd. I'd be like, tell him, tell, send him out. Tell him to call a medic. Tell him to call the governor. Tell him to go back where he came from. Tell him we hope they die. Right? Don't, don't sit in here because this is your first day in church. <laughs> you would be saying the same thing. Especially if he killed your wife last week. Or robbed your kids from their cradle. It is perfectly acceptable to believe that there are people in the crowd, Jesus' age, or could have been in the crowd Jesus' age, but were born in Bethlehem. And because of the people this guy represents aren't in the crowd that day. They had a knife stuck through their heart while they were sleeping. Because of a guy like this who said, go, kill them all. They mean nothing. Jesus, I need a favor. Jesus, I need something from you. Understand the tension yet? Well, we've all been there. You've had that same day. The person that's hurt you the most, the person that's 
wounded you beyond forgiveness. You may have even said the phrase, hurt, I'll never, ever be able to forgive them. That guy, that person has probably called you or came back to you and said, hey, can you help me out? Can you do this for me? Would you be able to um, would you be able to spare a little? And what did you say? (laughs) Exactly. That's exactly what you said. You went, oh, big surprise. You don't have any money. Well, it's your fault. You drank it all. You snorted it all. Do you not remember that we were married one time? And the reason we're not married anymore is because of this very problem you're coming to me over right now. You don't remember that? Or do you not under, Do you not remember the last five years and how you've treated me? Do you not remember last month and what you said to me? And now here you are asking me for help. You want me to bail you out again a second chance. Are you crazy? I've already given you ten. Seriously? I would probably throw in a, are you kidding? Go back to some of your drug dealing friends and let them help you. Go back to that woman you ran to and let her help you. Isn't that where you are? Go ahead. Thank you. Because Jesus is surrounded. By probably thousands of that type of attitude. And they're all looking over the shoulder of Jesus. What's he going to do? I can't wait. Maybe he'll strike him now. Not only will he let his servant, you know what, let his servant live, but kill him. I mean, can't you think of some scenarios that you could have helped Jesus out if you were there? I mean, wouldn't you have, like, sent him a little text message? Don't do it, Jesus. <laughs> hey, wait, you, you would don't freak. Remember the Alamo. You know, whatever village you had to throw in there. That's how we would have been. Because Jesus himself could have justified his and any response he wanted to. I mean, Jesus himself could have said, because of you and your people, I had to be born in one of those. Because your buddies wanted a census. And they made my mom and dad walk for days to have me in a trough. And your guy suffering? Seriously? But, verse 7 starts with, Jesus said to him, what do you think Jesus said to him? Come on, you're in church, go ahead. Fine, I'll heal you. Maybe he said, you know what, one time, but don't ask again. Maybe he said, but this is the last time. I'm, I'm go- it's Christmas. I'm going to do it this time, but no more. You're lucky I'm in a good mood. (laughs) You've all said that one, haven't you? I knew I'd find the phrase that you've all said. (laughs) That means you're all parents. You're lucky I'm in a good mood. (laughs) Here's what Jesus said. Shall I come healing? Now, I don't know why Jesus said it this way. I, but this is me, okay, you you do your own theology, but I think centurions here, all these people have like got over going, so Jesus goes, shall I heal him? And he looks at them like this. We just came off of that sermon, you remember? And long about three quarters of the way through, I said, 
Love your enemy. And I also told you that if you're nice to everybody who's nice to you, what good is that? Because even sinners do that. You see, I told you just, just a few minutes ago, you didn't even have to take, you don't even have to read your notes. You still remember. I just told you that if you want to see the kingdom of God, love your enemy. If you want to know about the kingdom of God, love your enemy. If you want to be a follower of mine, I just said, love your enemy. I just said that. So, shall I hail him? You see, that's the problem. Right there. We're looking over the shoulder of Jesus, wondering what he does to the offender. When we should be looking over the shoulder of the centurion as the offender. Especially at this time of the year, it should remind you that you are the ultimate offender. And Jesus looked back at you and said, no problem. No problem. I'm coming anyway. It doesn't matter what you've done. Coming anyway. It doesn't matter what you've said, who you're, it doesn't matter. I'm coming anyway. I'm going to go ahead and die for you. You see, so many times we're standing behind Jesus wondering how we should respond to all those offenders out there. And we forget that we are all those offenders out there. And we're all looking back at the face of Jesus saying, I need a favor. Jesus, God, I need a favor. And we're asking it constantly. And do you know the answer you expect? Okay. That's what you expect. And yet, from the other side of the coin, we are so quick to say, seriously, you're asking me? Come on. Where'd we go next? Quit using my notes. Jesus, he, he went through a couple of things with the centurion, but then he says this weird thing. And, and I'm okay to say Jesus said this is weird, or said it weird, because this is weird. I'm going to read it, and you're going to go, that's weird. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and it will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 12 he said, But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I just read it. What do you say? Yeah, isn't it? I thought so. What's he saying? Go back, show him 11 again. We'll show him the same thing. I say, many of you are going to, many are going to come from the east and the west. They're all going to come. Everybody's going to come in. There's going to be a massive amount of people who come, and they say, ah, I'm a Jesus follower. I got a place at the table. Heck, yeah. I've been following Jesus since I was seven. Baptize me at First Baptist Church, Mount something, somewhere. <laughs> I was careful not to offend. I have been signed, sealed, and delivered. I cannot wait till I die, and St. Peter welcomes me. I could do that for a living. I could say it that way. It'd get tiring. Cannot wait to get to the pearly gates and be welcomed by St. Peter. What Jesus is saying is going to be a lot of you like that. It's going to be a lot of you walking up in there going, hey, I belong here. Here's my ticket. Here's my ticket. I was good. I was good. I was really good. I, I gave every Christmas, I gave a gift to a kid that could not afford a gift. And every Easter, I hid eggs so that kids could come find them. And I even hid little stuff in them that told a story. Jesus. Here's my ticket. But verse 12 says, but the subjects of the kingdom, all those people who show up, money, will be thrown outside 
into the darkness where there be weeping and gnashing. Here's what I No. I'm going to say with confidence. Here's what Jesus is saying. There's a lot of you who say you're Jesus followers, and yet you treat people like you're not Jesus followers, and you're going to show up at heaven, or you're going to show up in the kingdom, and you're going to go, here's my ticket, and he's going to go, He may not go, but you're going to show up, and he's going to go, that ticket, not good enough. I told you to follow me. And when I told you to follow me, I told you you were going to be nice to your enemies. You were going to be kind to those who've actually hurt you. You were going to do things that are culturally uncool. But they're kingdom-minded. Show me that ticket. And you're going to go, but they were mean to me. But they hurt me. And I could bring you up here, and you could tell your story of hurt and pain. And many people in the room is going to give you a pass. And they're going to go, oh, you're okay, that's right. You should, yeah, you probably should be that way. And you've been giving yourself that pass. Listen, Jesus is not in the business of handing you out passes to not be his follower. There is no excuse. I don't care how much you've justified it for how long you've justified it. You're wrong. I'm wrong. I read, what is his name? Plant, Plant, what's his first name, Shane? Plant, pay attention, get off Facebook. What? David Platt, that's his name. He wrote a book called Radical. He got questioned a couple weeks ago about radical Christianity. You ever heard of that? Do you think what I'm talking about is radical Christianity? <laughs> David actually said, I probably should have titled my book, Just Normal. It just didn't sell as much. Because what we're talking about, we like to call radical Christianity. Because you're starting to push back already. You're starting to go, well, I'm not there yet. Mm -mm. I'm still, um, I'm a baby Christian. Baby Christian. Baby Christian. And since, I, since I'm a baby Christian, I don't have to do all the stuff. <laughs> you see, Jesus hadn't convicted me of that stuff yet. <laughs> I'm baby. Not cool. It just seems radical because we don't do it. This was stuff Jesus was teaching from day one. Love your enemy. Be kind to those who spitefully use you. It means they went out of their way to be bad to you. And when you turn around and are bad to them, you're just as bad as they are. Is that not what you've taught your kids? Well, if they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? Have you not said that? That's basically what Jesus is saying to you. Just because a Roman was bad to you, you want to be bad to a Roman? Now you're just as bad as the Roman. Someone in need comes and you quantify it or justify your response, you're just as bad. You're just as bad as whatever you've used to quantify and justify and not help them. Here's how all this changes. You start to see a centurion in the mirror. In that story, that's who you are for things to change. You're not Jesus. You need him. You're the one asking the favor. Start to see a centurion in the mirror, and things will change. Things will change. Let's all stand and get out of here. There's work to be done. And I don't mean just here in the building. I mean out there. Now, if you'd really like to help around the building, don't leave. Shake my hand, pretend to leave, and go back into the room. There is a special surprise for everybody who stays. That's not a preacher lie. There really is. If you stay in help, now I'm not telling what the surprise is. <laughs> it's like I ask for volunteers and they go, for what? No, 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 no. Volunteer first, I tell you later. It's better that way. But come and support tonight. Come and help support anything. Uh, seriously, I, I don't ask for help. <laughs> That's a lie. I don't ask for help a lot. Today, it's a plea. It's a plea. We got to have you. We got to have you. Uh, if not, Amanda's probably going to jump off of a building.
<laughs> what? <laughs> this one. <laughs> this one. <laughs> come out and help. And then come and watch tonight between 4 and 7 and, wa- and just be around and, and just help, love, and share. There's going to be families in here who have no idea about this. Your opportunity to plug back in. To plug back in. Okay? Let's all be dismissed. Um, who will pray? Who wants to pray? Who wants to pray? Paul, pick somebody to pray. Just point at them. Good job.